Great. There we are. Hello, happy Sabbath, everyone. We are so delighted that you have uh, decided to join us for this wonderful study that we are uh, going to embark upon today. And really, uh, just like last week, we still are just kind of hitting the highlights of certain subjects that we're going to be uh, developing more fully as the, uh, this uh, quarter goes along here, um, uh, this quarter. So I am Pat Barber, and I'm so thrilled uh, to be here with each one of you. And joining me is Pastor uh, Ray Daniel, who will be leading us in this study. Uh, hello, Pastor Ray. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, some of you may, I mean, uh, do you notice anything different about what's going on here? Can you tell what's different? Well, if you guessed that Dustin isn't here with us, it is because as uh, was announced a week or so ago, Dustin has taken, the Lord has blessed him with a different position that he has taken, which has taken him out of the state. And can you believe it? He says he couldn't continue with us. He actually is going to get very involved in the church there. You know, we saw no reason why he couldn't do all of it, but you know, uh, but we do wish him well. And we do want uh, everyone to continue to pray for he and Christine as they embark upon this new uh, adventure that God, new door that God has opened up for them. Amen. There's a couple of items that I do want to bring to your attention. One is that this weekend is the CBA alumni weekend that's uh, going on. So I'm sure that there are a number, if you are an alumni, that uh, you probably are aware of the various activities that are associated with that. And also this weekend or Sabbath afternoon at three o'clock at the College View Church is the memorial service for Dr. Marilyn MacArthur. As many of you know, we lost her uh, just a short time, of, time ago. And the family, uh, the MacArthur's, the Daniel family, this is Bonnie's sister, uh, the Krugers and Langs, and there's a um, uh, very, very large family uh, that I would ask that we could all uplift them in prayer, ask the Lord to be with them as they uh, come together as a family to sort of grieve and say their goodbyes and memorialize uh, Maryland. So that's uh, happening in the afternoon, uh, hence, are pre-recording the lesson here today. And Pastor Ray may have a little more to say about that. And then the other is, uh, let's see, our speakers for uh, Sabbath are uh, Pastors Shauna and Henry. So it's gonna be a very special treat uh, to have them here. And uh, there is a baptism today. You know, every Sabbath is a wonderful blessing. Uh, God, because God has made it holy, He's issued us the invitation to meet with us on Sabbath, but when there's a baptism, then it really makes it very, very, uh, very special. And uh, let's see, I don't have anything else, Pastor Ray, is there anything else that you can think of that you'd like to add before we pray and ask the Lord to uh, be with us during our study? Uh, no, uh, just to say that we would um, be very pleased uh, if you would be able to join us for the memorial service on Sabbath afternoon, it will be a very special time uh, for all of us as we gather together. Uh, we're having the uh, Nebraska uh, nurses group uh, perform their uh, uh, Florence Nightingale ritual. Uh, there will be 12 of them uh, performing that, and uh, that will make it especially meaningful. Um, uh, they mm -hmm. will escort the family in and escort the family out mm -hmm. uh, in their nurse mm -hmm. attire, a uh, very fitting way to uh, bid farewell. So we hope that, uh, that you'll be able to join us. And certainly we will be praying for each, each of you that, the, that, the, that this will be a very good uh, farewell, that the family will be able to uh, gain some comfort then with all those people around and the uplifted prayers. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we have a very exciting study as each of these lessons have been and are. 
Uh, but this one today, I think that you are going to really enjoy this one. And um, unfortunately, we aren't going to be able to take any uh, comments, but you are welcome to send any comments that you might have to me via text or email Pastor Ray or I uh, and I. And we will uh, try to share those next week. We would uh, spend just a few moments sharing the comments that, that you would make. Uh, and then hopefully next week we will um, be able to take the comments as they come in and share them in a more uh, timely manner. Uh, if you would bow your heads with me, let's ask the Lord's uh, blessing upon this study, all right? Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful, Lord, to be able to come together, to be able to open your word. What a privilege and what a blessing that you give us in your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be close, that your Holy Spirit actually would be the one leading this study and that your Holy Spirit would enlighten our minds, would help us to understand the truths that you have here for us. Dear Father, we ask your forgiveness for uh, our sins, each sin, we ask you please to forgive us because we don't want anything to stand in the way of being able uh, to receive the blessing Amen. of truth that you have for us. Dear Father, as always, we lift up before you all those that are in our prayer box. There's a number there. There are some names that's been there for a little while. And so, Father, we uh, again lift each of those names up to you. In particular, Carol uh, Booker has asked prayer because she does undergo surgery on uh, Wednesday and uh, would really uh, solicit our prayers, but so does each person. That's why they have asked that their name be placed in that prayer box. There's so many things happening around the world and so many things that are uh, going on around us. But at this time, Father, we ask you, please, if you would quiet all of that so that we can give all of our attention, all of our focus on the message that you have for us today. Thank you, Father, for giving us this time. Thank you for your Sabbath day. And thank you for your great love for us. We just love you so much. And we thank you for first loving us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, turn it over to you, Pastor Ray. All right. First, I wanna commend Sister Pat for <laughs> handling the technical side of uh, our lesson study and learning how to do it and doing it so well. So congratulations on that. Uh, fortunately, she does have a background in uh, technical things. And uh, that's why I asked her if she would do this for us. And she has uh, uh, certainly done a great job. <clears throat> well, we haven't gotten through the hour yet, Pastor Ray. So. Well, okay. Well. <laughs> Uh, let's let's assume that that's going to happen, okay? Yes, we will assume that. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> well, in this series of lessons uh, that we began last week, we're we're looking squarely into the origins of sin and death, and what the solution is to the problem that arose so long ago. Uh, we found here in Romans chapter 5, our memory text, how sin began. It entered by one man. One man. I would really think we should say it entered by one woman. <laughs> uh, but uh, be that as it may, uh, uh, the text says one man brought sin into the world. And as a result, death came. And thus death spread to all men because all sinned. I think our recent experience with the pandemic helps us better understand this word spread. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I don't think any of us, at least uh, I have not, ever been involved with something that spread like this did. Yeah. You know, we, um, we kept hearing about it in this country and that country and the other country and all the deaths happening all around the world. Uh, this thing spread like wildfire. And so did sin and so did death. 
it spread to all men. No one has been exempt from it. Uh, I suppose we could say um, uh, that there were a couple that um, were able to go directly to their uh, heavenly reward without seeing death. But uh, normally, uh, all of us die. And of course, uh, our family is fully reminded of that as we lay our loved one to rest this weekend. Um, so Christ, of course, was the one who created our world and our universe. Uh, we find that in uh, various passages. We, we looked at John chapter 1 uh, uh, in the first place that tells us that all things were made through him. Uh, there was nothing made that, that he didn't make. Mm -hmm. um, Colossians, by him all things were created, which are in heaven and on earth. Now, people of Jesus' day who knew him as a carpenter's son from Nazareth would find that hard to grasp. <laughs> uh, that this itinerant preacher was the one who created uh, the universe. Uh, they had a hard time uh, understanding that. And uh, the basis for crucifying him was that he had made himself God. He had made himself God. Uh, the truth was he didn't make himself God. He was God. That's right. <laughs> but they couldn't accept it. Um, uh, Hebrews also says that uh, Jesus uh, was appointed heir of all things through whom he made the worlds, the worlds. So he was the creator. He was the one who made everything, including Adam and Eve, made the Garden of Eden. Um, and so when this creative work was going on, uh, Lucifer... Uh, the leading angel in heaven became very envious. He was jealous of Christ, jealous of Jesus, jealous of the honor that had been uh, placed upon him by doing the creation. And that's how it all started. And he, uh, he plotted against Jesus. He lost that conflict. He was cast out of heaven. And so he decided his next focus would be uh, to destroy the happiness of Adam and Eve on the earth. Uh, he thought that if he could uh, get them to follow him and believe him and disobey God, uh, that somehow that would uh, result in opportunity for him and his fellow angels to be pardoned for their rebellion. Now, we have, um, we have uh, studied uh, previously that he had been given many opportunities to repent of his rebellion, right? That's, yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, it, it wasn't that God didn't give him a chance. No. Uh, but he didn't take any of those opportunities. But now well, he, he, thinks, wanted, he wanted he wanted to take them on his terms. Yeah, on in his terms. In other words, there there was no change of heart. Yeah, no change of heart. And and so now though, he thought, well, I've gone too far. I've turned down all these opportunities. Uh, maybe this is a way to get one more shot at mm -hmm. uh, at at being reinstated in heaven. So God knew uh, his strategy. He knew what he was uh, planning to do. And that's why he warned Adam and Eve very seriously to watch out for him. Uh, he, he, they told, he was told, they were told that they were not to eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because if they did, they would surely die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we see in this uh, that there were rules and regulations even at the very beginning of time. There was no uh, Ten Commandment law. 
that was revealed to them at this point. And yet there was a clear restriction uh, that he laid out regarding this particular tree. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take a look at what happened and uh, remember how they fell and how sin and death took over our world. And yet at the same time, we're going to see how God planted a seed of hope for mm. humanity. Amen. Even back there at the very yes. beginning of sin in the Garden of Eden. Are we thankful for that? So thankful for that. And <laughs> what what love, what love Amen. is already being shown there. I want to mention uh, that if you have not ever toured the College View Church foyer, mm. please do it. Uh, mm -hmm. I was talking with Pastor Terry Bach uh, the other day, uh, inviting him to an activity, and he said, I can't. I'm going to be leading a tour of the windows at the, at the College View Church. Mm -hmm. uh, those windows were created by an artist in Arizona uh, who happens to be a Roman Catholic uh, Christian, uh, and uh, she did an incredible job of that chunk glass that she mm -hmm. formed the pictures starting with the Garden of Eden and moving all the way through the life of Christ and the cross down to the second coming and the restoration of the Garden of Eden. Yes. And you can walk down that foyer and see that whole story. Please do that if you have never done it. They also have produced a printed folder with all of those <laughs> pictures and explanation of what each uh, picture represents uh, that you can get a copy of. Um, I think especially significant is the way it was planned to where as you come out the center doors into the foyer, uh, the picture of Christ is right there in the middle with his mm -hmm. arms outstretched. One arm pointing back to the Garden of Eden, the other arm pointing back to the restored Garden of Eden. And very beautiful, very, very beautiful. beautiful. And of course, uh, in the days that I pastored there, uh, every Sabbath as I would walk out after the message, I would walk right into the arms of Christ. In yes. the, uh, <laughs> and it was a, a special opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. All right. We moved on on Sunday to, um, to statements that we see our intention and uh, the first one is here in Genesis 1.31, uh, referring to the world as it came from the hand of the Lord. Mm. And it says it was indeed very, very good. Uh, <laughs> very good. It was very perfect. good. It was perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if God said it was very good, it was very it good. It was very good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So true. Now, um, in contrast to that wonderful uh, statement, uh, we have the admonition to avoid one tree in that garden. Mm -hmm. Don't eat from it. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a contrast between those two statements. Yeah. My. And how tragic, how unfortunate that God had to tell them that. Mm -hmm. uh, that that situation had to exist. Um, mm -hmm. But it did. And that was the reality of the situation that they faced. Uh, the, the reality of free will. And so the question is asked, uh, how does this passage, Genesis 2, 16 and 17, uh, show the reality of free will in this perfect place of Eden? Uh, why would God have needed to warn them if they couldn't freely choose to eat of that, of that particular tree? But they could freely eat of that tree. It's just that it had some dire circumstance uh, uh, consequences related to it. And you know, uh, in his God is just and he is merciful. 
And uh, he wanted them to make an informed decision. He didn't want to just spring it on them that, oh, by the way, that's the tree you shouldn't have eaten of or any such thing. God is not a God who he's, he's open, he's transparent, he's honest, and he wants us to make honest, open, informed decisions. He tells us in Isaiah, come let us reason together. He no. wants us to use the brain he gave us to make a decision. And so the decision, but as with everything else in life, some decisions that we make uh, are very, you know, it only has positive outcomes, but there are some decisions that we make that don't. And so this is one, and isn't it good to know what the, what the outcome of the decision is going to be? You know, you know, the law tells us that if you speed, you're gonna get a ticket. If you drink and drive, there's a consequence for that. So you have a choice. You can do that or you can not do that and still in, do, uh, enjoy driving a car. Okay, very good. So <clears throat> can it be said that they were not free to eat from that tree, but they were free to eat from that tree? Well, they were free. Yeah, they were free to eat from that tree. I mean, but God had told them if they wanted to be obedient to God, then no, you won't eat from that tree. Okay. But, but they uh, could choose to do it. Okay. But you you hear what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, they, I do. They were, they were not free to eat from that tree. They were free to eat from all the other trees. They were not free to eat from that tree, but they were free to eat from that tree. Okay, mm -hmm. you, you, get, yeah. you get the yes. nuance. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he yes. said Absolutely. he said don't do it. Uh, mm -hmm. You're not free to eat from that one, mm -hmm. but they had this freedom of choice where they could eat from it if they so mm -hmm. chose. If they so chose. And in that sense, they were free to eat from it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So it's it, it's a very interesting play on words there. Yeah, I see what uh, you're saying. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But mm -hmm. God had clearly told them. They were not free to eat from that tree. You, yes. you don't, you're, you're able to eat all these other trees. Don't eat that one. Don't eat that one. And can you imagine there probably was thousands of trees uh, because even right. now, when you think of all the fruit of, I just, you know, I grew up in Florida and mm -hmm. in orange groves everywhere, you know, and you think of all the varieties of oranges and I'm not talking about hybrids. I'm talking about, uh, you know, heritage or in my garden. I have, I like to grow heritage uh, tomatoes and, and various things. There's so many varieties of one fruit. And so can you imagine the choices that they had? Many, many choices. It's not like they were a lacking of fruit to eat no, or whatever no. it was on that tree to eat. Not at all. Um, so sometime after this warning, uh, Satan uh, began to unveil his attack. He assumed the form of a serpent, and he entered Eden. Mm. Eve beheld the serpent. Was, was this serpent uh, an ugly, horrible-looking creature? No. What you no. saw, Sister Pat? Yes. No, it was very beautiful gorgeous he could, had wings and could fly now personally i don't think a serpent would ever be beautiful but <laughs> <laughs> just because I, I just can't fathom it but it's, i'm so afraid of snakes but the but it was very beautiful and he was beguiling he was actually very me, uh, mesmerizing you know oh, so yeah. and just like satan uh, enter or Lucifer at the time entered into something that was attractive and beautiful, he packages sin that same way today. You know, he packages it as very beautiful and very uh, desirable for food, as food. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, when you talk about snakes, um, when I was pastoring at Maplewood Academy, um, it was necessary for Bonnie to step in uh, and do some teaching at the academy. And she uh, was in a classroom where Pastor Rich, who was my associate pastor at that time, uh, had his boa constrictor. 
oh. that he had brought back from South America. Oh. Uh, Pastor Rich was one of the first student missionaries from Union College. Mm. And uh, he had been down to Brazil. He brought back this uh, boa constrictor. And one day it got out and was loose. Mm. And uh, uh, Bonnie was not feeling very secure at that point until no. <laughs> until no. that boy constrictor was found and put back in its cage uh, mm -hmm. but this was a serpent that was very beautiful uh very appealing and uh and he was eating of the fruit mm -hmm. nothing happened to him uh, so putting yourself in the position of eve uh, why might you have thought he knew what he was talking about? Because uh, he said, yeah, you know, go ahead and eat. Uh, uh, you're not going to die. Mm -hmm. He says, you will not surely die. Yeah, he just mm -hmm. contradicted mm -hmm. God. He did. Uh, he also mis misquoted. I mean, um, uh, he said, as God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. God didn't say that. Uh, no. God said, uh, you can eat of all the other trees of the garden. But mm -hmm. anyway, uh, he misquoted to, to make it sound like they didn't have the freedom to eat eat of, of all those trees. Right. And, um, and then he just assured her, you're not going to die. Mm -hmm. So if we were in her position... Uh, why might those words have sounded convincing? Well, exactly as you say here, they didn't know death. And, you know, he was joyfully eating the fruit. He was eating it and juices dripping out of his mouth. I mean, it looks delicious. And he wasn't dying. As a matter of fact, he was very beautiful. And, and serpents probably did not normally talk to her. <laughs> and so, you know, and so then when he says that, you know, when he goes on and he talks about it would make you wise, then she was, her thought processes could well have been that, well, yes, because I mean, after all, serpents are talking now. Most of these animals don't uh, talk to us. <laughs> no, they don't. Um, I heard about a parrot the other day that was in a, a person's office. And when you would come in, the parrot would say, shut up, shut up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so parrots uh, do speak and uh, and so forth and some birds but usually the animals don't speak to us um, right now um if you get the uh publication journey uh are you oh, getting yes. that journey I do. yes we do we do i hope i hope many of our listeners and participants get that uh, magazine if you don't uh, you can order it it's free uh, Journey is a wonderful publication. Um, there's a, a small article, a continued article in there right now about a, a big bull speaking to a man. Hmm. Oh, you've got to read it. It's powerful. Uh, he, this, this animal speaks to mm -hmm. him, tells him that the seventh day is the Sabbath and he needs to stop violating it oh I mean, can you imagine that and uh, wow so, so if yeah. you haven't read that one you've got to find it um and then of course uh, uh balaam uh balaam had, yes. had a donkey that i uh, had a little mm -hmm. chat with him that's right that's <laughs> but right normally uh these animals don't speak and so she was impressed by the fact that this creature was talking to her mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. um so the fact that they didn't know anything about death, what it really was, the fruit looked perfectly good and tasty. Mm -hmm. uh, so from a logical standpoint, um, we could say that the serpent sounded much more convincing than, than God. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, she thought, well, why, why not try it? Yes, Exactly. You know, in uh, Spirit of Prophecy, early writings, and in the story of redemption, it talks about, it says that the holy angels often visited the garden and gave instruction to Adam and Eve concerning their employment and also taught them concerning the rebellion and fall of Satan. The angels warned them of Satan and cautioned them not to separate from each other in their employment. 
for they might be brought in contact with this fallen foe. The angels enjoined upon them to follow closely the directions God had given them for in perfect obedience only were they safe. Uh, and then on down further, it says Eve's curiosity was aroused. Instead of fleeing from the spot, she listened to hear a serpent talk. It did not occur to her mind that it might be that fallen foe using the serpent as a medium. And wow. I think that that's what happens to us sometimes. It's like you we're mesmerized. We're caught before we even know we're caught, you know, yeah. uh, and because how often have you said, how, how did I how, how did I get in this fix? Or how did I get, how did I get here, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, so does this tell us anything about uh, how safe human reason is? <laughs> well, it's not, it's not. <laughs> and we certainly are no match against the enemy of our souls who has had centuries, uh, millennia to, to uh, hone his skill at craftiness. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so even if we find things in, in the Bible and the word of God and, and we don't understand them, they don't seem logical or sensible, um, is it a good idea to go ahead and, and um, trust them? Anyway? No, no, no. Oh yes it is. It's a good idea <laughs> to trust the word of God. Oh, trust the word of God. I beg your pardon. <laughs> Say, trust in your it's own. It's a good idea to yes. trust the word of God, Positive. no matter how illogical it appears. No to matter us, how right? illogical. Yes. No uh, matter. Proverbs tell us to not sense. lean. Yes. Proverbs tells us to not lean on our own understanding. Yeah. And we, we truly cannot. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. I thought you were saying. I understood. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. I know what you were saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, we also need to understand that there are things that are not evil or wrong in themselves, mm -hmm. uh, but God has chosen them as tests of obedience, and, um, and he wants us to, um, to abide by them. Uh, when he tells yes. us something, uh, he wants us to do it. That's right. The Bible says, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Mm -hmm. Jesus said those words himself. Yes. Well, uh, that applied particularly to the communion service, which we enjoyed together last Sabbath, didn't it? Yes, yes. And, and the foot washing that we took yes. part in. Mm -hmm. uh, how thankful we can be that we can celebrate that. So um, we need to realize that this experience of Eve in the Garden of Eden is not just a single case. Uh, that we are faced every day with decisions, whether to stick with the word of God, to do what God says, or to go with the seductive appeals of our surrounding culture. Is that true? That is true. Yeah, every day we have those. Every choices. day, yeah. Whose voice are we going to listen to? Which tree are we going to eat from? Uh, we're still facing that. Mm -hmm. So... Um, on Monday, we uh, look further at this temptation that the serpent presented to her. And um, we saw once again that uh, Eve uh, used the wrong criteria. Uh, she uh, looked at that fruit. She thought it looked good. Mm -hmm. And she went ahead and ate it. Um, he used several uh, rhetorical strategies to mislead her, as we saw. Um, he started by saying, has God really said you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? You know, has he really said that? Uh, and Eve um, added to God's prohibition. She said, we're not even supposed to touch it. God didn't say that. No. He, he didn't but say he couldn't touch it. Adam might have said that, though. <laughs> 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 yeah he might have um and uh and so she should never have touched it either uh you know that That's led right. into it um uh, mm -hmm. and then of course uh, satan came back well you won't die you won't die mm -hmm. don't worry mm -hmm. about it um and then he told her uh the reason why you're not supposed to eat of this tree is what 
because you're at, for God knows that on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So he's saying uh, the reason he doesn't want you to eat this is because uh, it's going to be a huge advantage for you. And he yes. doesn't want you to have that advantage. That's right. Now that God is holding something back from you. Yeah, he's holding it back. Uh, can you imagine a God who had done all this for them and created all this beautiful garden and all this fruit and all this gorgeous stuff that they enjoyed and giving them each other this beautiful woman and a handsome man to enjoy life together uh, that he had given them all this and yet was holding back. Yeah, no, it doesn't no. make any sense at all. It doesn't <laughs> make any sense at all. No. Not only that he was holding back, but he's restricting you. You know, uh, he, he's, he's limiting your freedom and he's, uh, you know, uh, it's something, and he wants to, he is the only one that wants to, to be wise. You know, he's selfish. There's a whole lot of messages contained within this, uh, this that, that sentence there where he's saying that your eyes will be open, you'll become like yeah. God and so forth, you know. Well, he was right about one thing, that if they ate that fruit, they would know good and evil. That is absolutely true. <laughs> that but is it was true. evil that God didn't want them to know. Yeah. But he you know, was right when, about that. He was. When I read that, it made me think of, uh, I remember when uh, these uh, drug commercials, drug commercials weren't always on television, uh, but they, you know, I mean, they're every commercial on TV now practically is one, but when they first came on TV or, and they still do, it, it's exactly following this pattern <laughs> exactly because it's saying, you know, it's going to help you with whatever the problem you happen to have plaque psoriasis or this or that or the other thing not picking on that one but I mean any whatever it is and you've got these people who are smiling and dancing and laughing and just having a great time and this that and the other thing and it's telling you you know it's going to within this amount of time it's going to clear this up and so forth and so on but then they start reading off really fast towards the end as the people are laughing and you know having a grand time uh uh which comes in to hear where it says that the um, uh, you would know good and e knowing good and the evil that portion there. So that's the bad part. So then all of a sudden on those commercials at the very end, then they say, well, you can have diarrhea, constipation, lose your hair, uh, this form of cancer, <laughs> this da 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 da. They say it fast and they say all these horrible things that you don't want. Probably your plaque psoriasis isn't nearly as bad as the rest of that. <laughs> now, I'm not suggesting anyone, I, I mean, I'm not giving no medical advice at all, but just the fact that there's all this bad stuff here that's just rattled off quick at the end. And it's like the same thing here. You are so enamored by all the good there that you kind of miss knowing good and evil. That's what you really don't want. And so no, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah, that's a good illustration of that. Um, so anyway, she saw uh, the first thing she did was see the fruit and yeah, and she saw that it was good for food. she, mm -hmm. she couldn't deny that. And then it was a delight to her eyes. Mm -hmm. And then when she heard about making her wise, yeah. Oh, wow. Um, that was the thing to do. Yeah. Now, some people argue that all forms of knowledge are valid as long as we retain that which is good. You know, everything's good. Uh, and and uh, we can benefit from all knowledge, everything that there is out there. Uh, is that true? <laughs> no. <laughs> No. no, there's some there's some things better not known, you know, <laughs> better not known. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, we learn from this experience of Adam and Eve there in the garden that knowledge can be very detrimental. Yes. Uh, would to God that man had never learned evil 
had yes. never had to experience evil. Uh, mm -hmm. God didn't plan on that. I mean, he, he no. didn't intend. He didn't create us to know evil. And he did his best to keep us from ever knowing it. Mm -hmm. But this is how man learned what it was and mm -hmm. learned what death was as a result. Um, so uh, we're told here in our lesson that this account teaches us how easy it is to rationalize and justify our own sinful choices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So here we have his assurance to Eve on Tuesday. You will not die. Mm. <laughs> what are the many different ways that this lie has been repeated through the ages? Well, a few that I wrote down are uh, necromancy or, you know, communicating with the dead, uh, the lie that you go straight to heaven or hell or purgatory, uh, the lie that you uh, can are reincarnated, uh, the a doctrine that is prevalent in, in some uh, uh, specific churches, uh, praying to dead saints, so or immortality of the soul which our lesson really expands on, but there's a number of them, of those kinds of things out there that uh, is this same lie in a lot of different forms. Exactly. Um, one of the most dangerous, I believe, is Mariolatry. And yeah. the idea that the Virgin Mary, Jesus' mother, is still alive, and she keeps appearing here and there uh, yes. to various people. Uh, I know when we were in Boston, she appeared in a hospital window, and mm -hmm. people came by the droves to try to get a look at her in that hospital window. You know, mm -hmm. there's this gullibility that's built into this view that you live on after you die. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it was the same lie that that he told Eve, you will not surely die. Mm -hmm. And it's being preached from pulpits today, from Christian pulpits, that you do not die, that you live on uh, right. after death. Well, we are going to live on after death, but not immediately. Not immediately. That's right. So um, we're warned against uh, those who... <clears throat> suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And this is one example. If you promulgate this view that you live on after you die, you are suppressing the truth because God told them you are going to die. You mm -hmm. will die. That's right. So um, this led to the mummification practices in Egypt, uh, the building of the pyramids, um, uh, it came through philosophy of the Greeks. Um, uh, we see this quote by Socrates, are you not aware that our soul is immortal and mm. never perishes? And then the soul is immortal and imperishable and our souls really exist, uh, really will exist in Hades. That's in hell. Yeah. And so here you have the view um, that scared the bedoodle out of most people through the Middle Ages, <laughs> that if you die and go to Hades or to hell, that you're going to be burning in that fire, roasting and toasting for forever. Eternity. Yeah. For eternity. Mm -hmm. uh, a horrible, horrible thought. Um, but in contrast to that, um, God had said plainly, that doesn't happen, that when you die, you really die. Yes. But at the core of Eve's temptation was his assurance, the serpent's assurance, you will not die. Mm -hmm. And he says, you certainly will not die. We looked at some passages this week that show just the opposite. And these are passages that we need to be fully acquainted with because this issue of the immortality of the soul is one of the key issues 
in these last days of time. We've been told that clearly. Amen. Amen. That Amen. Sunday sacredness and the immortality of the soul. Those are going to be the two big issues in these end times. Mm -hmm. So we need to know what God says about it. And here we have some of those references to look at today. How thankful we can be for each one of them. Amen. The dead do not praise the Lord. They don't. They don't praise him. Um, and then we see um, here in the next one uh, that the people who have died are in their graves and they will not live again until they hear the voice of the Son of God. Mm -hmm. So they're not anywhere else. They're not, their spirits nowhere else. They're not living on somewhere else. They're, they're dead. They're in their grave. Uh, uh, we saw in Psalms, his spirit departs. He returns to his earth in that very day. His plans perish. Other version says his thoughts perish. Yes. You, you don't think there. Your, your, your mind is not working. Um, and so forth. So we see these uh, passages. This one in 1 Corinthians is so important. Uh, mm -hmm. Telling us that, that death is like a sleep. Uh, we're not all going to do it. We're not all going to die. There will be a group of people at the end when Jesus is about to come that will never die. Uh, they will go directly into eternal bliss uh, alive. But most of us will have died and will have been sleeping for some time uh, until he comes. And then when he calls, we come back to life. Amen. So we mm. know from these passages clearly that death is an unconscious state until life is restored by the resurrection. Immortality is not ours now. It's not ours now. We don't have it. No. It's given to the righteous at the resurrection. That's the only time we get it. Uh, it says uh, in verse 53 of 1 Corinthians 15, this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Yes. You have to put it on. Uh, you, you don't have it. It's not something you possess. It's something mm -hmm. that's given to us. And yet this theory that we have this natural immortality uh, persists in all these books and movies and TV shows and uh, popular sermons from Christian pulpits. Uh, even science we see has gotten involved. Uh, we, we saw this week there's a foundation in the United States to create technology that will enable us to contact the dead, uh, that, that they're being called PMPs, post-material persons, and mm -hmm. this technology will enable us to communicate with them. Hmm. Do you want to, do you want to get involved with that technology? I do not. Now that you're, uh, now that you're technologically uh, <laughs> adept, you know, you've proved that tonight, Oh, uh, dear. Surely, surely you'll you'll want to latch on to that stuff, sister. No, Beth. you want to run away <laughs> from that as far and as fast as you can. Yeah. Because uh, the havoc that the occult wreaks in people's lives is untold, you know. Uh, and we're kind of um, many people love thrillers. Uh, you know, they love uh, they like to be made scared. You know, they like oh, yeah. they, they like that kind of thing. And it's kind of it's it's a little dangerous, you oh, know, when when yeah. it's is involving the occult. And I just wanted to read one uh, uh, verse here that when the Bible is talking about immortality, it always it seems is referring to God. And in First Timothy uh, 6, 15 and 16 it says King of Kings and Lord of Lords who only had immortality, Amen. Amen. you know, and that. So God is the only one that has immortality at this time. As a matter of fact, had they eaten that fruit, I, I mean, had they not been barred and, and driven out of the garden, that might have happened, <laughs> you know, oh, after, oh, after oh, absolutely. the fruit, you know. That's so, why, that's why they were not allowed in. That's, That's why they right. couldn't get back in that garden. Absolutely. 
Uh, yes. So do you think that as we look at all this going on around us, this um, theory being promulgated, that we should hear the voice of God saying to us again, do not eat from that tree. That's right. Don't eat from this tree of knowledge that is being promulgated, that the dead live on. Don't eat from that tree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and uh, we need to uh, heed his voice today, just like they should have heeded it back then. Amen. Well, um, we looked at the consequences of sin on Wednesday. Um, and we saw um, what happened uh, right after they decided to uh, make the wrong choice. Uh, they uh, all of a sudden had switched allegiance from God to God's primary enemy, Satan, mm -hmm. Lucifer. Mm -hmm. uh, they believed him instead of God, so they switched allegiance. Uh, did they have any fear after they did this? Yes, after they did it, they certainly did. And, and we do today in different forms. You know, we're not... Uh, hiding our, ourselves in the garden, but we uh, have uh, bought into, not, not every person, but I just mean in general, have bought into the lie that God is a wrathful God. Oh, you know, yeah. all these negative things, you know, that, oh, the God of the Old Testament is a mm -hmm. wrathful God. Yeah. Uh, that uh, acts of God, when there's these catastrophic uh, 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 disasters that occur, or he's unfair, he's unjust, he's waiting to pounce on you, he's waiting to, to throw you and burn you forever, and all kinds of things. All of that is fear that is wrong about God. The fear that he wants us to have, of course, is just reverence and respect for who he is and who we are in the whole scheme of things. He yeah. is God. We are his creator, his cre creatures. His creatures, amen. Uh, I have a sermon entitled, Good God, Bad God. Mm. So the real God, please stand up. Oh, I'd love to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so we do have that contrast. We have that wrong picture of God. And, yeah. uh, and what, how did they manifest their fear right after they made the wrong choice? Well, they hid themselves they hid in the them. garden. Yeah, they hid themselves. Now, is that what they normally did when they saw God coming? No, I'm sure they looked forward <laughs> to that time in the evening, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, when uh, when your children come home to visit, do you uh, hide in the bedroom? <laughs> no, no, no. No. I practically meet them at Interstate uh, 80. <laughs> <laughs> you're, yeah, you're happy to see them. And no yes. doubt they were they were happy to see God all the time. Not there, not oh, now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did they experience any shame? They did. And oh. blame. <laughs> I kind of put those two together: that shame and the blame shame, together. Shame and blame. Yes. Uh, uh, how did they manifest this shame? Well, one thing they did is they uh, covered themselves with fig leaves. Uh, well, I don't know if it was fig leaves, but they covered themselves with leaves. With leaves. And to, yeah, to hide their nakedness. You know, that was they one of the things they did. They didn't, they didn't know they were naked until then, did they? That's right. Uh, That's why right. didn't they know? Why didn't they know that? Well, they uh, were enshrouded. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say they were enshrouded in this, this, uh, the glory of God. Yeah, they had a, a, a beautiful light covering. So they didn't know they were naked until the light covering disappeared. That's right. Uh, and then they felt this incredible shame. Um, did they do any accusing? Oh, they did. <laughs> oh, yes. You know, well, this woman that you gave me, well, and she said, oh, well, the, the serpent in the garden instead of and that's a key thing for us today and we've talked about that in many of the lessons that we have studied that just talking about how god wants us to take resp personal responsibility and he wants us we have to be accountable for our actions because confession which is what that's what confession is acknowledgement 
of our sins mm -hmm. or confession is the first step towards forgiveness because the Bible tells us in first John says, if we confess, That's that right. is if we acknowledge, if we uh, take the responsibility for, if we, we could use any of those terms, uh, our sins, that he is faithful, he is just, and he will forgive us. And then he'll do more than forgive us. He'll cleanse us. Amen. So these are some of the things that uh, followed uh, their wrong decision. They also lost the garden. Yes. Uh, they were told now they were going to have to really do some hard work, not the enjoyable work they had done in the garden. Mm -hmm. uh, they were going to degenerate, uh, not mm -hmm. only them, but nature. Uh, yes. And their lives were going to go downhill, and eventually mm -hmm. they were going to die. That's right. Uh, that's what happened. So mm -hmm. we see that the real significant thing about eating that fruit was the fact that Eve was breaking her loyalty to God and assuming mm -hmm. this new allegiance to Satan. So uh, in Genesis 3, uh, we see some of these most tragic uh, consequences. Uh, from a theological perspective, uh, they were overtaken by theophobia. Mm -hmm. Had you heard that word before, theophobia? I had not. <laughs> I hadn't either. Uh, mm -hmm. Being afraid of God. Uh, from a psychosocial assessment, uh, they were ashamed and began to accuse each other. From a physical standpoint, they were going to have to sweat and feel pain and eventually die. And from an ecological perspective, the natural world was going to degenerate. And they began to see that. Uh, mm -hmm. It was no longer the beautiful, pleasant place that it, mm -hmm. that it used to be. And as they witnessed in drooping flower and falling leaf, <clears throat> uh, I look out in our garden and I see some of these beautiful roses drooping, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you notice that in yours? Yes, yes. And the leaves and then they, falling. And yeah, they droop. And uh, yeah. notice how powerful that effect that had on them. Adam and his companion mourned more deeply than men now mourn over their dead. Hmm. Can you imagine yeah. that? I can't. But how how deeply, how remorseful they must have felt as the full impact of what they had done yeah. must have, how it must have felt to them as it sunk in. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah and, yeah. and to realize they had caused it. They had they caused, had caused it. it, yeah. It mm -hmm. was their fault that all this bad stuff was happening. It was happening, um, right. Oh, my goodness. And it, and it just it, it tore them up. It, it, it made them so sad, incredibly yes, sad. Yes, exactly. Uh, and, you, and Pastor Ray, before you move on down, I actually had a number five. And my number five was spiritual death, which is separation from God. Oh. Up there. is It was the next one I had because... Um, that's anytime, good. you know, anytime, you know, the relationship was broken, uh, you know, sin, we know is alienation from God and, um, and to be separate from God is death. And so um, we're dead, we were dead in our sins until Christ, that's why we have to be born again. There's a number of scriptures that support that. Amen. So that was the next one that I had was that uh, there was this, the spiritual death because there was not that communion that had existed there before. Oh, very good. W was that in the lesson or did you add that? No, I added that one. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> I, I was hoping I hadn't missed something there. Oh, no, no, no. You didn't miss it. <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I'm glad you added that. Very good. Um, well, you know, it would be bad enough to think back to Adam and Eve and what they did wrong and say that was horrible and we're so sorry that happened to them. It doesn't involve us, it just involved them. That would be nice <laughs> if we could isolate it and say, okay, that mm -hmm. happened way back then, it happened to them, that was their problem. They suffered the consequences and that was the end of it. Unfortunately, mm. 
uh, that's not the case. The sad and painful fact is that just as humanity had experienced through all the has experienced through all the ages, we today suffer the consequences of what happened in Eden. That's right. That's yeah. That's right. Yes. Yes. And that's why it says that this sin and death has passed and spread to all of us. That's and that's why we're having to have a memorial service again this weekend for our loved one. Yes. Because yes. it's passed on to her uh, mm -hmm. already. And um, each time we lose someone, uh, we experience the pain and suffering that came from their wrong decision there in the Garden of Eden. That's, That's tragic, right. isn't it? Very tragic. Very tragic. Yeah. And then it's time now to move from the tragic to the good news. Yes. The first gospel promise. All right. What is that, Sister Pat? The first gospel promise. Oh, the promise of a Messiah. God had the solution before there ever was a problem. Now, that is a God that I am grateful to serve. Amen. And uh, so he promised them that even though they had fallen, even though they had allowed this serpent to deceive them, that he was going to be taken care of in the long run. Yes. And um, he was going to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And between uh, their time and the destruction of their enemy, uh, there was going to be an enmity between them and, and him. That's right. And uh, that, that victory would ultimately be gained over this serpent, this, this being called Satan or Lucifer. Uh, he would be defeated. That's right. Uh, he gave hey. them assurance of that. Amen. Can you imagine, and we do have examples in the Bible where that enmity seemed to not exist in some of the Bible uh, uh, characters that we have read about. And if, the, if everyone was like that, the world would have destroyed itself, but for God already by now. So I'm so grateful that God did put the enmity there and that there are people who did, who accepted that because we do have examples of some who didn't, you know, we have Cain who killed his brother, you know, we have, there's just a, there's numerous or the, the uh, antediluvians, you know, the people except for this one family. And so. Uh, so you're we, saying uh, not all of mankind was finding him an enemy, were they? That's right. And uh, that's and we see that today. Yeah. We see that today. Not everyone views him as an enemy. That's right. Uh, they've been in cahoots with him and are still mm -hmm. in cahoots with him. Uh, that's right. But for those who love God, uh, they view him as an enemy and um, and and uh, don't have any love for the, for this enemy of mankind. Uh my dear mother, as she declined in health, uh, began to say, oh, I just wish I could lie down by daddy. Mm -hmm. And I said, mom, you're making death seem like a friend. And the Bible says the last enemy that be, shall be destroyed is death. Death is an enemy. It's not a friend. Don't be talking about it as if it's a friend. Uh, well, I understood what she was saying, don't you? Sure. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> I understood that. Mm -hmm. But still, we, we don't want to um, miss the idea that death is not a friend. No. Uh, uh, death was the consequence of this wrong choice of our forebearers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, the word enmity 
in Hebrew implies not only a long lasting cosmic controversy between good and evil, but a personal repulsion to sin, uh, which has been implanted by God's grace in the human mind. But I'm afraid it's not fully implanted in many of us, probably in most of us. Mm -hmm. But um, we don't hate sin as much as we need to, do we? That's right. You know, if, if we if we truly hated it like Jesus did, uh, we wouldn't be attracted to it, would we? We would not. We wouldn't be attracted to it. Mm -hmm. uh, he wants us to be dead to sin. Um, but instead, uh, we in the past have been dead in trespasses and sins instead. Mm -hmm. uh, he wants us to be dead to sin instead. And that can only happen through the power and grace of Christ. Uh, when we were slaves of sin, we were free in regard to righteousness. But then when he came along, he gave us the power to be free from sin and be a friend of righteousness instead. That's what we need. That's what we need. That's right. The Lord uh, used an illustration at the very beginning. Oh, yeah. Uh, he, he, uh, he sacrificed an animal to give them clothing. What was that supposed to to indicate? Uh, what was the message in that? Well, it was pointing forward to the sacrifice of our dear Savior Jesus. Yeah, uh, that there was going to have to be a death, a substitutionary death. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you can imagine Adam and Eve trying to grasp the idea that their creator was the one that was going to have to experience this. How would that make them feel? I, I cannot imagine the grief that oh. that must have that that must have caused uh, them oh. to feel because we just read just a, a day ago of how they grieved over the falling yeah. fading flowers. And then this idea now that an animal is killed, that's a greater grief. And then, because I'm sure that he knew them all very well. And then the, this idea that now, as you say, that the create the one who created me, the one who put his mouth on my nostrils and breathed life into me is going to, to die because of something I did. Yeah. It, it, it just is, uh, seems unfathomable grief. Oh, yes, it is. And, um, uh... I've talked about this before, the different levels of grief, and one of them, of course, is, is suicide grief, and mm -hmm. in that one, you, um, you blame yourself, and, and to think that you caused one of your loved ones to kill themselves, mm. that's a burden that many people carry around and say, that was my fault, I, yeah. I did that, I did that. Mm -hmm. Well, after God made this initial sacrifice of the animal to give them clothing, uh, Adam was instructed that he was to start making sacrifices of animals as well. Mm. And we see a picture of that here in Story of Redemption. Mm -hmm. uh, when Adam, according to God's uh, instructions, made an offering, it was a painful thing. Mm -hmm. His hand had to take the life. And it was the first time that he had witnessed death and seen it himself. And as he looked upon the bleeding victim, I can hardly read this. It's just so yeah. painful. As yeah. he looked upon the bleeding victim writhing in the agonies of death, he was to look forward by faith to the son of God whom the victim prefigured, who was to die man's sacrifice. That's what he was supposed to see in that. And that was true of all the sacrifices from that time until Jesus himself came. That's right. That was to signify that. Mm -hmm. uh, and lest we forget, Adam lived 930 years. Oh, I think oh, was. You know, oh. I mean, I don't know how old he was when, when uh, this occurred, but 
He still had a long time to live. That's a lot of sacrifices. A lot of sacrifices. Um, when I read this bleeding victim and writhing in the agonies of death, uh, it reminds me of why my wife, Bonnie, became a vegetarian when she was a <laughs> CVA. It was because of this very thing when she went to Omaha to the stockyards on a field trip mm, mm. and watched the execution of animals there. Mm. Uh, you know, she had grown up on a farm in North Dakota where they killed and processed their own meat and so forth. Mm -hmm. She had not really seen it like that. And and when when she saw this, it, it, it turned her off so bad. Uh, mm -hmm. She said, I'm, I don't want anything to do with that now. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is uh, what was so hard for Adam to do, to realize that he was taking the life of this victim, but even more important to realize that this symbolized what his creator, the son of God, was going to go through for him because of what he had done. How thankful we can be that um, God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Mm. That he was offered once to bear the sins of many, including mine and yours, to those who yes. eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin. For salvation. Can we say amen? Amen. 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 <laughs> yes, amen. <laughs> and so these texts uh, reveal uh, the fulfillment of the promise of victory over Satan that God gave them there in Genesis 3.15. That's when it will be fulfilled, uh, when Satan is removed from existence. Well, uh, until then, uh, we're still in a battle with that same enemy. Uh, he's still doing what he did to Joshua. Uh, he's uh, saying, well, you, you have all these filthy garments. Uh, how can you uh, stand before God? Mm. And God says, wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> take away those filthy garments. Uh, I've removed your iniquity. I, I'm going to clothe you with rich robes. I want a clean turban put on his head. Mm. Don't we what want that in picture. our lives? Yes, we do. Yes. We, we want to be pardoned from our iniquity and our filthy garments taken off. And we want to be clothed with his rich robes and have a clean mind and a clean turban on our heads. Uh, that's what yeah. God is able to do for us. Uh, that is symbolized in that wonderful story of the prodigal son. Mm. Bring out the best robe and yes. put it on him. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord, do that for us today. Amen. Bring Amen. out the best robe mm. and put it on us. What do you say? I say amen. <laughs> thank Shall you, we Jesus, pray? for it. Yes. Father dear, thank you so much for this wonderful assurance that we've reviewed today. As tragic as it began, as unfortunate as it was that our forebears made this choice and ate of the fruit you told them not to, we see what you have done ever since to atone for that, to make it possible for us to be restored once again to that beautiful garden. We look forward to that, dear Lord. We thank you for understanding what happens when we die, that we sleep until we hear your voice, and then we come forth and are clothed with immortality Amen. and will never more die because of what Jesus did for us by giving himself in death, in our place. We praise you and we praise him for that great love, so great that you were willing to give your only begotten son that we might live forever. Amen. In his name we pray, amen.
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ray. It's a wonderful lesson. And we'll, um, oh, there we go. Very good. I, I need all the help I can get here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Sister Pat.